to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. His banner over me was love. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse number 4. We welcome you today to our study of the book of the Song of Solomon. Today's lesson is being brought to you by individual members and Christians in your area. And we want to encourage you at this time, if you don't have your Bible out and ready, Locate your Bible, go get it, let's have it ready, as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study of this beautiful book, The Song of Solomon. As always, we want you to know that Christians are bringing this broadcast to you, members of the Lord's Church, and we'd love to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area, whether it be on Sunday night or Wednesday, or Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday for Bible study, You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about other souls, and who be happy to sit down and study the Bible with you. And so check out the Church of the Christ in your area. You won't be disappointed. You visited them. They're just simply people who believe in doing what the Bible says, want to worship and act like Christians did in the first century. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of God's Word and desire to know Him better. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com? From our website, you can access all of our material free of charge. We have audio lessons, video lessons. We have written transcripts, study questions, a lot of articles, other good material, and it's all available to you 24-7 free of charge. In fact, we have a wide variety of lessons. We have lessons on every book of the Old Testament, every book of the New Testament, a large variety of topical studies. We'd love to make those available to you free of charge. You can go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You can fill out a media request form. If you'd like to have that digitally on your device, we can send you a digital download, or if you'd like to have it in CD or DVD form to listen to or to watch, we'll send that to you as well. We even cover the postage for doing that. We want to share God's Word with other people. Our mission at the Gospel of Christ is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. That's what our mission is, and we're so glad that you joined us for our study of the Song of Solomon. How many lessons in your lifetime have you heard on the Song of Solomon? How many times have you read or thought about this book? Well, probably you could count the number of times you've heard lessons on this book on one hand. It's not a book we think about, not a book we read much, but it is a great book with a great theme. What's the theme of the Song of Solomon all about? It is a celebration. The Song of Solomon is a song, a celebration of married love. The key word that you find popping up more than any other word in the book is the word love. In this short eight chapter book, it occurs 30 times. L let me show you what I believe to be the key verse related to that idea is. Look in chapter 8, and I want you to see the strength and the power of married love. Look at Song of Solomon chapter 8. This is such a beautiful verse. Look at chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Solomon says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. Why? For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames, jealousy's flames, are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly destroyed. Isn't that a beautiful passage describing the power and the value? If you gave all the wealth of your house for love, be utterly destroyed. Many waters can't quench it. Uh, it's worth more than you could ever imagine. 
And so the Sol Solomon is here pleading, and the Shulamite is pleading for the beauty of married love in their relationship. There's a key phrase that we need to mention that occurs multiple times throughout the book. And the key phrase is this, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Well, what's the idea there? Wait, wait, wait. Don't rush it. Don't push it. Don't try to force it to happen. You've got to give love time. The idea of love is not uh, uh, just a fuzzy, warm feeling. Love is action. Love is what you do because you care for the other person. Love is sacrificial. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. And so love is not something you rush into. It's not something you got to hurry up and get before it fades out. Real love only gets stronger over time. And so the writer says, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases to remind us you've got to give love time to build and to grow to the point of where one is ready for that relationship. Now, there are also some key characters in this book that you need to know about. Of course, the, you have the character of Solomon, the Song of Solomon. Solomon is the male here who's getting married to the Shulamite. That would be the woman who he is marrying. You've got the daughters of Jerusalem who are seen as her friends, kind of bridesmaids or friends, if you will. And then you've got her brothers who are often referred to as the little foxes. They're antagonists, and as sometimes the case is, the family may not like the, the, the one that a person chooses. They kind of play that antagonist role here as well. There have been different ideas throughout the centuries about interpreting the Song of Solomon. And, and I want to mention those to help us understand what this book was really designed to do. There's an allegorical view that this is nothing more than an allegory representing God and Israel. God is Solomon, Israel is the Shulamite, and thus this is a God and Israel's relationship. A oh, friend, it, you've, there may be application and implication to some of that, but you don't find that idea in the Bible. That's not what is taught in the Song of Solomon. That's not what is taught or implied or taught anywhere else in Scripture. Then there's a, a, a what we call a typical or a typified view, and that is this is a type of Christ and the church. Christ would be like Solomon, the church would be like the Shulamite, and this is describing their relationship and their love. And while there's no doubt Christ is the bride, the church, or Christ is the groom, and the church is the bride, Ephesians 5, verse 21 through 33, you have to go outside of the book of Song of Solomon to get that. That's not what is, I want you to think about this. When this book was originally wrote, when it was originally written, was it designed to be a type of Christ in the church for its original recipients? Well, no, that, that would have done nothing for those people. And thus we would say the literal view is the best. That is, this is a manual. This is a guidebook. This is a story or a picture about marriage, about the ups and downs, the highs and lows, and the beauty of married love. And anybody who wants to have one of the best marriages you can imagine needs to gain the wisdom that we see from the Song of Solomon. And so let's do that. Let's approach the Song of Solomon with the mindset that this is a guidebook, uh, a, a recipe for good marriages. What do we learn about marriage from this? Number one, you learn that you've got to exalt your mate's good qualities. Look in Song of Solomon chapter 1, and I want you to notice what Solomon does here in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Here we hear these words. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore the virgins love you, draw me away. His good name, the, the closeness of his love, his good qualities, they're exalted here. And so if, if I'm going to have a, a marriage that's happy and healthy, friend, we learned from the book of Proverbs just a couple of lessons back that a, 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 a contentious wife 
is like a continual dripping. Something that nags all the time is not going to make a happy marriage. A man or woman, either one that does that. Well, in this one, you've got to exalt your mate's good quality. People need to be built up. People need to be, the things they do to help the family that are good, that are godly, we need to appreciate those. We need to say thank you. We need to honor that, that part of our, our spouse, our husband or wife that, that is so good and helpful in every way. But then just as poor, important as it is to exalt your mate's good qualities, you also have to learn to overlook the minor blemishes. I'm not talking about major flaws that are moral or things like that, but everybody, everybody has things that are unique to them that maybe don't, we wouldn't do it that way. That's not how we like it. That's not what we're used to. In marriage, it's all about compromise and you've got to learn to overlook the minor blemishes. Let me illustrate. Chapter one, look in verses five and six. The Shumite says, I am dark but lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not look upon me because I am dark, but because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyard, but my own vineyard I have not kept. And so she has what she feels like is a blemish. She was working out in the vineyard. Her skin was tanned and darkened more than, I guess, everybody else's. She stood out, and it looked like a blemish maybe to her and to other people. But friend, Solomon makes no light of that. That's not something he focuses on. The, that blemish in her own mind, which really may not have been as bad as others thought, that's something that was never highlighted, something that's never emphasized. And so in this life, you've got to learn to overlook the things that are not maybe the way we would do it. Worst thing to say in marriage is this, especially for a husband. That's not the way mama did it. Uh, when my daddy worked on the car, that's not the way he did it. Uh, this is something that I really wish you'd do differently because we never did it that way in my family. Listen to Genesis 2 verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There's leaving that behind, doing things together, working together, and working toward that ultimate goal as husband and wife. And so you gotta learn to overlook the minor blemishes. Then you've gotta learn to express your love to each other in a good, right way. Look in your Bible in Song of Solomon chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, and we'll read through chapter 2, verse 7. Solomon says, I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. We will make you ornaments of gold with studs of silver. While the king is at his table, my spikenard sends forth its fragrance. The bundle of, of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyards of Engedi. Behold, you are fair, my love. You are fair. You have dove's eyes. She goes on to say, you're handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant also. Our bed is green. The beams of our houses are cedar are rafters of fir. I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley. Like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. And we could read more there, but you get the idea that these two are in love. They express that love. They build up one another. They, they honor their good qualities. You know, it's not this way. You remember the old story where someone said, I told you when we got married that I love you, and if anything changed, I'd let you know. Oh, friend, that's not the way it works in marriage. We need to remind each other how much we appreciate them, how beautiful they are, how much they are needed, how we love them, and there's nothing wrong. It is good and wholesome and right for people to express their love in the right way in marriage. Marriage is honorable. The bed undefiled, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And then, of course, you need to never forget what we might refer to as the springtime of your love. Remember what it was like when you're in love. Remember how wonderful that was. Don't ever forget what you had 
why you married this person. Look in your Bible in Song of Solomon chapter 2, and I want you to listen to what is said in verses 10 through 14. She says, the Shulamite says, My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flower appears on the earth, the time of singing has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs, and the vines with tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, come away. O oh, my dove, in the cleft of the rocks, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet, and your face is lovely. There's no doubt as you consider these two that they are indeed in love. There's no doubt that, that, that you can feel that in the words that they're saying. And, and we need to be reminded again of the person you married. You need to be reminded of why you married that person. You need to be reminded of the love that you have and how that love should grow and be deeper on many, many different levels. And then this, for a happy marriage, you've got to remove any external circumstances that might be a thorn in your marriage. Look at chapter 2, verse 15, and let me show you what I'm talking about. Here her brothers now come into the picture and listen to what they say. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. It's as though they're they're taunting her. They're taunting their love. We want to take your focus and attention off of that and back on us, as it were. It looks like they're trying to spoil everything in these words. External circumstances, whatever they may be, a family, you don't want family to get in the way. Family can be a good help. We all promote and thank God for family. But husband and wife have got to do it together. If they're friends, Relatives, others who are trying to interfere or cause problems, that's something you've got to remove from that scenario or it's not going to make you. If you bring people in who are always telling you how they, they think you need to do it better or all the problems you're doing or how to fix it, then you're going to create a whole lot of problems in doing that. And so remove the external circumstances that can ruin your marriage. And then this idea for a happy marriage. You've got to be committed to each other only. You've got to make a complete commitment to the one you marry. Listen to Psalm chapter 2, verse 16. In response to the brothers who are taunting her, she says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feeds his flock among the little. She is, they're trying to get her focus away from him, and she says, No, no. We're committed to each other and each other only. You're not going to interfere in what's going on here. You're not going to cause problems in our marriage. We have made a commitment to each other, and we've got our own business that we're concerned about as husband and wife. And so make a real commitment to each other. Don't make a commitment to your wife plus or your wife if or this marriage probably. Make a complete commitment to each other, have each other's back, work together, fight through the fights of life and the challenges together, and always hold each other up and encourage one another. What else could we mention? Men especially, and this is what's happening in chapter four, sometimes I think we forget this. Don't forget to tell your woman just how beautiful she is. Look at Song of Solomon, chapter 4, with me. Listen to what Solomon says to the Shulamite. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep, which having come up from the washing, every one of them, bears twins as none is barren among them. And it, and it goes on to mention here a, a lot of illustrations. Now, when you tell your woman how beautiful she is, I'm not saying that you, you tell her hair, her hair is like a flock of goats coming down the mountain. That's probably not going to set well today. But then it would represent the black flowing beauty 
of that hair, like just the black flowing nature of that. Um, the shorn sheep, the beautiful, crystal clean white teeth. Um, again, these images are, are not ones that we're familiar with today, but for their day and age, people would have caught on and that would have been a great compliment then. But here's the whole idea. Men especially, you need to remember to build up your wife. You need to remember to tell her how beautiful she is, how much she means to you. Listen, well, there's this mentality. I don't know where it came from. There's this mentality that if you're a man, you are strong and you conquer things and you never say anything that might show any idea of weakness or... No, that's just not true. Real men tell their wives that they love them and they are not afraid to tell them how beautiful they are. And that beauty isn't just exterior. That beauty is on the inside. A woman who fears the Lord. Charm is deceitful, the proverb writer would say. Beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Proverbs 31, verses 30 and 31. And so we want to remember to build each other up in that way. And then this idea in making a marriage happy. For marriage to be what God wants it to be, there is also the fulfillment of the desire God has placed within each of us. Hebrews 13, 4 reminds us, marriage is honorable, the bed, the relations that go on there, undefiled, holy and upright and pure before God. With that in mind, you've got to let your desire be only for your mate. That's the way God intended that. Look at Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse number 10. Song of Solomon, chapter 7. Look at what the Bible says in verse number 10. The Shulamite says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. The desire, even the sexual desire. Where's the proper place for that? Only inside the bonds of marriage. If marriage is going to be what God wants it to be, friend, you've got to let that desire be filled within the proper relationship, in the proper area. And that desire is holy. Sexual desire is holy, right, and just, and godly inside marriage. That's what God designed. There, there's nothing wrong or dirty or unclean about that. The, the sex and everything about it has been made so unclean and filthy and shameful by the world today. My friend, inside marriage, that's not the case. It's pure, good, right, holy, necessary, and important to the marriage relationship. And then if our marriages are going to be what God wants them to be. Love's got to be the bond that holds it all together. Look at the verse we began with. Look in Song chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. I want you to see how love, married love, is described here. The psalmist again says, or the Shulamite says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love, is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. What's love all about? Friend, Bible love is secure. Set me as a seal upon your heart as a seal upon your arm. A seal has the ability to make something secure, to make it safe, to, for it to be authentic. That's what love is. It, it's safe. It's secure. It's authentic because it's from God. Love is strong. It's, listen to what the writer says again. Love is as strong as death. Not only is love secure, Love has great strength and power. Um, you, the love you have for your wife, love for your children, love for the Lord. 
Friend, those things are stronger than life itself, than the things that we sometimes cherish. You just can't put a price on the strength of that. It's unquenchable. Many waters cannot quench. It's a fire that you could put all the water in the world on, and it's not going to douse it out. That, that's not the way love works. And then love is priceless. If a man were to give for love all the wealth of his house, it'd be utterly despised. If you emptied your bank account and tried to give all that for love, nah, it wouldn't. if you traded that for love, you'd be the laughing stock. Why? Because you can't put a price. Real love is invaluable. You couldn't put a million dollar, ten million dollar, a billion dollars. Having someone that loves you, you can't put a price on that, that really loves you. Now, jealousy, that'll burn a marriage out. Its flames are flames of higher, most vehement, vehement flame. Jealousy, where people are always looking over their shoulder or wondering, that'll burn your marriage out. But real love, that's something that'll last. And friend, I want you to know this. We're talking about marriage. We're talking about helps for marriage. But please understand this. Nobody has ever loved you more than God loves you. Listen to the words of John 3, 16. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved so much, He gave. And friend, the strength, the power, the invaluable price of that, Jesus went to the cross because He loved you so much. Have you responded in love? Jesus said, if you love me, Keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. Have you obeyed the gospel? Do you believe Jesus is God's Son? John 8, 24. Have you turned from a life of sin? Acts 3, 19. Would you confess the Savior as the one who saves you? Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And would you be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins? If not, we're begging you today to do that. Join us next time as we'll study more from the Word of God. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.